My name is Miquel Garcia Prieto. I'm the Managing Director of Triodos Bank here in Spain. And today I have the great pleasure to introduce you to Kate Raworth, Rayworth, <laughs> sorry for the pronunciation, <laughs> and her book, The Danet, um, the Danet Economy. We live a moment where we can kind of perceive an increasing social and planetary awareness and increasing uh, thinking about what are the challenges we face in this moment in relation to people and in relation to the planet. But we also live a moment where we see that this consciousness has to become or has to be transformed into realities. And of course, we see many realities already happening and many opportunities. We see top-down things happening like the Paris Agreement or the Sustainable Development Goals, but we also see bottom-up uh, initiatives happening and for all this new sustainable construction on organic farming, on electric cars, on green energy, on all these participative uh, movements. But I think we are also aware that we have a certain sense of urgency now. It's not that things happen, but things have to happen in a certain rhythm and in a certain time if we, if we want to manage, manage properly the challenges we have on the table. And for that, we need a joint, a very strong commitment between all the parties involved, between the public administrations, between the civil society, between the businesses, and of course, between the scientific and academic uh, community. And I think this understanding that this all together is one of the big challenges we have today is not an issue that only civil society can change, that is not only depending on regulation of the public administration, is an issue of, uh, of all of us. And of course, in finance and in economy, we also need to do such a uh, step. We need to integrate in the economic decisions beyond the financial return, that every economic decision has a positive or a negative <coughs> impact, and that needs to be taken into consideration into the economic uh, decision today. We in Triodos, we are working on showing that that is possible for nearly uh, 40 years now. And today we want to thank very much to Kate for creating these very effective images, ideas that can support the transformation of the way we look at economics. Her economic model in the Danat economy, her, her ideas about the regenerative economy or the distributive economy, illustrates very well the way we can uh, go forward in a different understanding of economics. Kate is an economist focused on exploring the economic mindset needed to address the 21st century social and, ecolo and ecological challenges. As she said on her website that I strongly recommend you to visit, wayward.com. As an economic student, she found that the theories lectured by her professors were completely outdated. Looking at society as a machine, at the environment as a collateral detail. Uh, today, Kate Rayworth is a senior visiting research associate at Oxford University's Environmental Change Institute. She is also a senior associate at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. She holds a first-class BA in politics, philosophy, and economics, and an MSc in economic for the government from both Oxford University. She is a member of the Club of Rome and serves on several advisory boards. So, a part of all these formalities that are good to know with whom we are talking with, let's be inspired by her, by her ideas on the Danet uh, economy. And let's be aware of the big influence she is having uh, around. Let me tell you about this, Roskia. This hole in the middle is a place where people are falling short on life's essentials, where they are lacking food or water, health care, energy, education, political voice, housing, income, work. And these 12 social dimensions, I crowdsourced them from the world's governments. They are 12 dimensions in the Sustainable Development Goals. So all of the world's governments have agreed that every person in the world has a claim to meeting these. And of course they are rooted in 70 years of human rights. 
We want to leave nobody in the world in this space of shortfall. Get everybody over a social foundation into the green Roskia itself. But, and it's a big but, we cannot overshoot the outer edge because there we put so much pressure on this extraordinary living planet on which we depend that we begin to kick it out of balance. We cause climate breakdown, we acidify the oceans, catastrophic levels of biodiversity loss, air pollution, chemical pollution, a hole in the ozone layer. And these nine dimensions around the outside are known as the nine planetary boundaries, first drawn up by Earth system scientists in 2009. They believe these are the nine critical life-supporting processes that hold Earth in the stable and <coughs> benevolent state that it's been in for the last 11,000 years, the Holocene phase of Earth's history. So if you put the two together, leave nobody falling short, but don't overshoot our pressure on the planet, the simplest way I can say it is we need to meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. And I believe this is one way of drawing a compass for the 21st century, a compass for what human prosperity looks like. But if I offer this to you as a compass, then you want to know where the needle is pointing. And that's not an easy picture to look at because you can see that we are falling short and overshooting at the same time. Here, all the red wedges show how much people are falling short on life's essentials. So here on food, this goes 11% of the way to the middle of the circle because 11% of people worldwide don't have enough food to eat every day. Uh, on water, I've used two. 9% of people don't have access to clean water. One person in three worldwide doesn't have access to what we would call a toilet. But on all of these, you can see that there are millions, billions of people falling short, and they are in countries rich and poor. So while millions of people still fall short on the very basics of life, we are already overshooting at least four of these planetary boundaries. The ecological ceiling for climate change is 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But this time last year, we went over 410 parts per million. So we are overshooting on greenhouse gases. We're massively overshooting on biodiversity loss and on excessive nitrogen and, fertil uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in fertilizers. <coughs> Doesn't get taken up by the plants, but goes through the soil into lakes and rivers and kills off life in the water. And we've converted too much of land surface uh, Earth's surface for human use, for agriculture, cities, transport. We don't even know where we are globally on air pollution and on chemical pollution. <coughs> so this is a picture of humanity and our planetary home at the start of the 21st century. I say <coughs> it is our selfie. We, the people of the early 21st century. And we are the first generation to look at this picture. We're the first to see not only that we are falling short, but we are also overshooting. No economists of the last century saw this. So why would we imagine that their theories were good enough to deal with the challenge? No business leaders last century saw this. Why would we imagine that their business strategies were good enough to take this on? I believe that as the generation that first sees this portrait of ourselves, seize this challenge. We need new economic theories, we need new business strategies, <coughs> a new understanding of human well-being if we're going to turn the story around. Because I think this is our generational challenge and the challenge for which our children's children will remember us. Not for Trump, <laughs> not even for bloody Brexit, <laughs> but for this, ultimately, Will we begin to put this story back on track or not? Of course, many, many things need to change in order to get this story back on track. And I often stand here and talk about how we need to rewrite economic theory to do that. But I'm not going to talk about economic theory today because I want to have a conversation 
more focused on where I think many of you are coming from. But let me tell you some of the things that are already happening. I was delighted to be contacted by urban designers, uh, this organization Urban Minds, in Stockholm, in Sweden. They said, we are building a new suburb of Stockholm, this area here. Uh, there's a train line here, you can see a train line that was built 15 years ago and never opened. And there's going to be a suburb here about 15 minutes away from downtown Stockholm. And on their design table, they sent me the photo and said, look, we've got your donut on our design table because we're using it as an aspirational blueprint for thinking about how to design this suburb in a way that meets the needs of all the residents within the means of the planet, respecting the ecosystem into which we're building it. They said, we are going to call these donut districts. And I thought, what have I done? <laughs> uh, but it, it, this idea of redesigning cities with this aspiration. I was really amazed and very honored to find out that uh, a former student of mine, who now is back in Beijing, he sent me this photograph. He said, I'm at a conference in Beijing. And, and this gentleman, he's Professor Wang, is presenting China's renewable energy outlook. The story of how China is going to switch from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And this report comes once a year. It's from the government organization. The second slide he showed is the donut. Uh, and I was really amazed, uh, fascinated, that he had chosen to use this image to act as a paradigm explaining how China is switching from fossil fuels to renewable energy, that this helps explain the new vision of prosperity. So many changes are needed, and one of my favorite conversations is to imagine business leaders in any company. Imagine if every company drew up its corporate strategy sitting at this table, asking itself, not what do we do with our philanthropic spending, but what do we do in our core business? How are we running our core operations? Are they pushing humanity out of this space? Actually, we're not paying minimum wages or living wages. Uh, workers in our supply chains are not allowed to organize. We know we're having a big impact on the climate or water use. Or is the company actually designed intentionally to help bring humanity into this space. I first drew the donut in 2012, and I've been having conversations with companies for the last six years, showing the donut, and really fascinated by the very different responses that I hear from different companies. So let me tell you about what I call the corporate to-do list. So the five main responses that you generally hear. And the first one is the oldest one, do nothing. And they'll say, well, it's a very sad picture you show us of the donut. We're overshooting, we're falling short. But you know, the business of business is business, as Milton Friedman said. Uh, and everything we're doing is nearly legal, so we're just going to carry on. This is the oldest response, but we know it's by no means enough, and it doesn't work today. There's no room for it today. So the first response then is, we'll do what pays. Okay, if we can save money by cutting carbon emissions in our supply chain, then we'll do some of that. If we will get a niche consumer market because we have a green branding stamp on our, on our product, we'll do that. It's beginning to go in the right direction, but it's incremental. And I don't believe it's going to happen nearly fast enough to take us there. So the third step is to do your fair share. And you might hear a company say, well, <coughs> our government has committed to cut carbon emissions by 20% in the next 20 years, so we'll cut our carbon emissions. We're doing our fair share of that cut. Fine, but as anybody knows who has been out to a restaurant with friends, and everyone says, I'll, we'll, we'll put in our fair share for the bill. If you are the one left holding the bill at the end, it very rarely adds up to what is needed. And this is what we see at the climate change negotiations, year after year after year. I'm not putting in my fair share till you put in your fair share in this jostling between countries. It also can quickly flip around, not from what is my share to contribute, but what is my fair share to take. Some companies, particularly fossil fuel companies, would say to me, this carbon budget, <coughs> that you show us, how much of that is my fair share to have? 
So we need to move beyond that mentality. So, do nothing, do what pays, do your fair share. Going up to the fourth, now we're getting transformative. Do mission zero, do zero harm. We're going to have zero carbon emissions in our supply chain. We're going to have zero uh, waste water coming out from our factory. This is transformative because it's completely different from the 20th century business model. But as the designer Bill McDonough says, why do 100% less bad when you can actually break through the ceiling of your imagination and do good? And so we got to the top level. Can we be generative? <coughs> Not doing less harm until we do no harm, but actually in the very way we do business, create positive, net positive, generative good. Let me give you some examples of what I mean by that. I believe that we need, if we're going to, come back within the means of the planet and meet the needs of everyone, we need to put two design principles at the heart of economics and at the heart of business. To be distributive by design and to be regenerative by design. So distributive by design. In the 20th century, Many things in business were concentrated by design. The, the large central shareholder-owned company, the oil rig, the coal mine, that centralized control. We can create this century, I believe, distributive design, because, especially because the technologies of energy and ideas want to be distributed networks for the first time in human history. But there are other ways of creating distributive design through business too. Employee-owned companies. This is John Lewis, which is one of the most uh, successful and much-loved companies in the UK. It has uh, 17,000 employees, but they're not called employees, they're called partners. And they all get a profit share every year. This is the announcement a few years ago of their 17% profit share. Of course, we want companies that share profits with all of the employees, not only with shareholders who may never even step into the company but also sharing that value down the supply chain, paying a living wage to workers throughout the supply chain before increasing the dividend to investors. <coughs> what about distributive design of energy? This is a community-owned energy project in Cornwall in the United Kingdom. The possibility of communities owning their own energy systems and having that distributive ownership of the capacity to generate energy is totally unprecedented. How can companies enable communities to become part of owning that asset of generating wealth through energy? And this, I know it looks like a rock concert. It's actually an uh, intellectual property meeting. This is Drupal, which is an open source software used to make websites. This was actually their meeting in Barcelona. And they're all doing this with their fingers, as if to say, I may be just one drop of a team bringing open source ideas. But look what happens when you put all those drops together. You get an ocean. They you all use Drupal, and they come together once a year to co-create new software, new uh, <coughs> materials that they can use. Every company in the world would love to have this dedicated research and development team. But they're part of a new movement of open source design, co-creating and sharing the value through the Creative Commons. What about regenerative design? This <coughs> diagram through the middle is the degenerative, linear 20th century economy. We take Earth's materials, make them into stuff we want, use it for a while, sometimes only once, and then throw it away. And this take, make, use, lose, it cuts against the cycles of the living world and pushes us over planetary boundaries. So we need to bend the arrows around. Here, on the biological side, allowing nature to regenerate. So always saving food waste and letting it decompose and be recreated. But here also, on the technical side, materials that we people create should never be thrown away, but should be refurbished, reused. And this is, of course, the circular economy. It needs to run on sunlight. Last century, we looked down for energy. This century, we will look up to the sun. 
I believe it needs to recognize that the waste from one, one process becomes food for the next. Designers here say there is no such thing as waste. It's just a resource in the wrong place. It needs to be modular by design so that you can take apart this clicker if it breaks and repair just the piece that was broken. And I believe it needs to be open source as a materials uh, ecosystem. Let me give you an example of the contrast. Here's two smartphones. This is an iPhone. It's glued shut so that nobody can get in except for Apple. And if it's going to, be, if it's going to go around this loop, it has to go back to Apple. They want to retain control over this. It's a 20th century proprietary control. This is a Fairphone, which is made not only ensuring that there is no slave labor or child labor or exploitation, making all the minerals and metals used in the phone, but the back is transparent, it's open. Anybody can take it off. It says right here, yours to open, yours to keep. And if you go on the internet, there's a video explaining how to change the battery, how to upgrade it. So it's open source by design. And I believe this is part of a 21st century ecosystem of industrial manufacturing that we need. A very, very different paradigm. <coughs> I'll give you a few examples of the beginnings of this circular economy. This is Houdini, a Swedish sportswear company. And all of the clothing they make is made either from wool and tensile, which are organic fibers, so they can be decomposed. In fact, they took some of the wool clothing, they put it in a compost bin, turned it into soil, grew some mushrooms on top of it, and then they served it back to their customers and said, you are eating your old ski wear. <laughs> so it's either made of wool and tensile, or it's made of recycled polyester, recycled nylon, which can be used again and again. Now they say, bring the clothes back to us because at the moment there is no circular economy for all materials. They'll also repair your clothing. They'll repair your other clothing. They will uh, loan you, you can rent ski clothes. So it's a very much a bigger idea, not always owning the clothing, but renting the clothing. Houdini's clothing is fantastic. It's also expensive. Of course it's expensive. Just as it was expensive to put solar panels on the roof of your house in 1975, when you're the only one doing it. But once this becomes standard and part of regulation, once it becomes necessary for everybody to, to, to put all fibers through a circular economy, the price of these clothing will come down and it should become normal practice. This is a car from Open Motors. If you buy one of their cars, it will arrive like this, like a, a shelf from Ikea. You hope it has good instructions. Uh, they say if you know what you're doing, you can put this car together in one hour. Good luck. <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing, though, you can take it to somebody who does because the design of it is open source on the internet. Anybody can see how it's assembled and how all the parts go together. It's modular by design, so you can replace and remove any single part. It runs 100% on electricity, so it runs on sunlight. And this is just the basic chassis. Now, once you've got the chassis, it can be customized to turn it into an electric streetcar, uh, an airport buggy, a golf car, it's part of 21st century distributed manufacturing. <coughs> I live in the city of Oxford, and all of the mini cars in the world are made in Oxford, and they're shipped out of the factory at the end of my street, uh, full of air. <coughs> and then they're shipped all over the world, full of air. We should be shipping the parts and assembling around the world, so it's a distributive and regenerative form of industry. So, let me pull back. I believe we need distributive design so that value is shared far more equitably with all who co-create it. Employee ownership, ethical supply chains, community-owned assets like the energy system, using the creative commons, but also regenerative by design so that we are working with and within the cycles of the living world. An economy and a business that runs on sunlight, waste is food, modular by design and open source. It's such an adventure. 
now that we are to reinvent economies, reinvent business in this direction. And I believe we're in the middle of a psychological drama between two mindsets that are competing with each other. And as I describe this, I'm sure you will be able to feel the tension maybe in your own enterprise or in an enterprise that you know. It's because the 20th century was very much dominated by one overriding question in business, which is how much financial value can we extract from this enterprise? And we hear it coming from the heart of the financial system. <coughs> but when I talk to 21st century urban designers, uh, car designers, progressive companies, they're driven by a completely different question, which is how many benefits can we layer into the way we design this? What else could this do for the community? What else could we be contributing, giving back, generating, creating? It's a very creative mindset, totally different. And for <coughs> the question is, why is it that some companies that I meet are speaking so clearly from here, whereas others are still pulled back here? And here I draw on the work of Marjorie Kelly, a brilliant business analyst. She came up with five design traits or characteristics of a business that really help us understand where a company is in this psychological drama. So first of all, what's the company's purpose? Ask uh, an ordinary car company, what is your purpose? And they might say, well, we want to be the biggest player in our sector. That's a very 20th century purpose. If you ask Open Motors, that company I just showed you, Open Motors, what's your purpose? Their purpose is to democratize mobility. A totally different purpose, far bigger than themselves. How about governance? How are you governed? What are the metrics by which you assess your own success? What are the metrics that your employees must report against every week, every month? The old metrics, classic. Do we have growing sales, growing profits, growing market share? And employees are required to show that in their sector they are driving this growth week on week. 21st century metrics, are we cutting carbon out of our supply chains? Are we tapping into customers who are aligned with our values? Are we paying living wages through our supply chains? Very different metrics. Networks, how are you networked? Are you managing to relate to customers, to suppliers, to uh, other businesses in your same sector who are aligned with your 21st century vision. And now, let's really go deeper. This, this is like corporate psychotherapy. And in psychotherapy, we go to the deeper stuff where it's the really powerful things. Down here, deep. How are you owned? Are you owned by shareholders? Or are you owned by the employees? By patient capital? By impact investors? By a family firm? Because how you are owned has a huge influence on the kind of finance that comes to you and the question that that finance is asking. Is it pulling back to this 20th century question, but how, many, how much value can we extract from this now? Versus how many benefits can we generate along with a fair return? And I think many companies are caught in a psychological drama here, almost a split personality. I think of Unilever, a company that I admire, as a company that's caught here because Unilever, when I listen to Paul Pullman, the purpose is very much 21st century, a sustainable living plan. It's got a very impressive set of new metrics for measuring progress in that direction. It networks with NGOs, with progressive companies, it lobbies governments. It's all pointing in this direction of 21st century transformation. But it's still owned predominantly by the stock market, with finance clearly partly asking this whole question which is why this time last year, Unilever was exposed to a hostile takeover bid by Kraft 3G. It's a split personality. Everything is trying to align here, and the old stock market pulls it back here. <coughs> to me, this is a, a very common challenge. I mention Unilever only because that happened in a very public way. But many companies face this internal challenge. And, face, and I speak with people, they say, we. We are wrestling with this in our meetings all the time. Of course, what we need to do is turn all these arrows around so they're all pointing in the same direction, which makes it a really fascinating adventure. How do we create new forms of ownership 
that actually allow enterprise to be aligned with its new purpose and ultimately finance. What kind of finance is aligned with this generative vision? And of course, this is why I'm very happy to be speaking, hosted by Triodos, because I see Triodos as one example among many of finance that is precisely designed to be aligned with this 21st century vision. We need much more finance innovating in this space to make it possible for enterprise not to be split in two and to truly pursue this new generative vision. So, let me pull back and, and invite you to imagine yourself in any enterprise or indeed any organization you're involved in and ask yourselves, in what way can we become regenerative and distributive by design? And as a question to you for our discussion, if I, if I added two more empty signposts, what other design principles would you say are important for making this possible? What else would you add here? What are you already doing in the way you're working and thinking about making that 21st century design possible. So let me end there and say, if you're interested in learning more about the seven ways of thinking that are described in my book, I had the privilege of working with some of the world's best stop motion animators. We made one minute videos of all of the seven ways to think. You can see that they're playful, they're funny, they're silly, which I think is very important for making economics far more widely accessible. If you're interested in being part of a discussion, I've recently launched uh, an online discussion group, Open Forum. There's a discussion on donuts for business. There's a section that's all in Spanish uh, and in other languages. We're trying to turn this into a community conversation of shared resources, examples, questions, and open debate. So please do join. Let me end there and say that I very much look forward to having a conversation now. Uh, if you want to challenge and criticize anything I've said, I really welcome that, because sometimes it's in the challenge that we get down to the more interesting points of view. Uh, but I very much look forward to a conversation. Thank you very much.